Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Maria Stryer, and I am the producing artistic director of Club Thumb. I'm speaking to you from the East Village, which is also where Club Thumb's offices, rehearsals, and productions, when they take place in space, occur, and which is also the unceded land of the Lenape people. <clears throat> in the last 14 plus months, those of us who wanted to make work had to figure out how to do it differently and with different tools. We at Club Thumb were initially resistant, but after enough time passed, realized that we had to adapt and uh, learn some new things. We chose this particular project, which was slated to go into rehearsal about a year ago today, in part because Rinna suggested that 10 older actresses might be the last people who'd be heading into a tiny tight theater to work. It has been a fascinating journey. Some <laughs> <clears throat> years of exploration that led to initial version of the play and then a very, very different development rehearsal and production process once we'd started working virtually. And just as we created a website to host the digital production and to expand on the history, narrative and process behind it, so we thought it would be interesting to share a little bit about what led to the thing that we made, both in its earliest inception and to the way we ended up making it, which was very different from anything we'd ever made before. So I'd like to hand it over to playwright Rinne Graf, director Tara Ahmadinejad, and associate director NJ Aguna, who in addition to playing a crucial role in the process will be our interlocutor this evening. Thanks guys. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here with the both of you. It's good seeing you. Good to see you. Yes. Um, so let's get it started, shall we? <laughs> uh, great. Rena, would you like to talk about the origin of this play? Give us a little bit of background. What inspired you to um, write The Women's Party? Uh, sure. I mean, I'll start by saying that many years ago, I think it was in 2015, maybe 2014, um, Shana Taub and Rachel Sussman were working on a musical about Alice Paul. And, uh, and they're the ones, uh, when they first came to me to talk about this possibility, I'd never even, I didn't know who Alice Paul was, which I feel quite ashamed to say. Um, and they gave me all this material about, um, the Equal Rights Amendment, but also mostly they were focusing on the fight for suffrage, which is what their musical was about. And in the end, timing and all sorts of factors didn't work out. And um, they ended up, Shana is now writing the book for that musicals, which is wonderful. Um, but, uh, but it was always sort of in the back of my head, this thing that, um, this amazing history that I'd heard about, and also just the incredible complexity of the figure of Alice Paul. And Several, many, many years after that, uh, Maria Stryer, and I am forever in her debt for this, came to me at a moment and she said, I want to commission you to write a play. Um, Club Thumb was my first real professional production in New York. Club Thumb has been a part of my whole career, uh, produced me many times. Maria Stryer has acted in my plays. Um, I've been a part of writers groups there. It's just Club Thumb is so essential to me. And uh, for Maria to come to me at that time and ask me to write something was so deeply meaningful to me. And then she said, I want it to be all women. Um, I just want to write a, I want to produce a play right now with all women. And the moment that she said that, I remembered this little tiny part of this research of, I mean, I feel like somewhere in my office, I could find like all these packets and packets of research and there were these three little pages that had to do with this night at the woman's party and this coup attempt and i just thought that is the play that i want to write so that sort of is how it started um and maria pushed me i remember there was this one time when i was like you don't have to commission me this year and she was like no 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 we're commissioning you this year and so she she kicked my butt to get it going and, um, and I can talk more about that process, but, um, but that was really the impulse that, um, that the moment that she said, a play with all women, I thought, ooh, I know the subject matter that I want to take on. Wow, that is amazing. And just the community um, 
coming up behind you to help you move this way. And I am curious about how the collaboration between you and Tara got started and um, how it went, you know, generally, how, how, how did you like working with each other and building? Well, I can start just by saying that, um, that I, that I'd seen Tara's work and I was excited to work with Tara as a theater person, which is how I know her and knew her and how we met and talked about the play. And we can sort of go back and talk about that. We never got to work on the play together as a theater piece, really, um, because the moment that we started really diving into work was working in this new form. And I have to say, I didn't really know that Tara had such expertise in in multimedia when I met her. And when I when I called you, Tara, to be like, could we think about this as virtual and the way you jumped into it? And maybe you'll talk about that some more, but I feel this tremendous blessing that you are also incredibly adept in this form as well, which I didn't know when I met you. Yeah, and I mean, I will say like, I feel like Rinna has so much um, drive and conviction. And so particularly at that moment when we were like, what's happening with the world? <laughs> what's gonna happen with this piece? Are we gonna do something? Are we gonna wait? And I remember, Rina, you just had, you were like, I have this hunch and I think it can work. And it was, and it was like a, it was, I mean, the same way you're saying that Maria kind of like gave you that push. I felt like you gave me that push to be like, all right, let's, let's take this on. And it, I mean, it immediately felt right to me and as a candidate for this, um, this realm of digital theater, which is so many different things. Um, uh because of like all of the like formal invention in the play and the, the playfulness of it um there was just so many things about about it that felt like they could be really well suited to to that transformation um but at the same time there were like a lot of things that you could be like well how are we going to do that how are we going to do that and i really feel like it was like because because rena was like yes i have faith that this can work like that is actually what made it um possible um and i found that like really essential to this um to this collaboration particularly at that at that really like that moment of great uncertainty in the world <laughs> mm -hmm. as well as in like theater fantastic um and just to respond to that too um you're reminding me tara i mean i love the word conviction uh, i I hope that I had it and I'm glad if it inspired you. But I think for me, it, it felt like a lifeline that I just, um, that I, to use the word bereft, um, in my particular circumstances feels like a vast overstatement, right? Because if there's one thing this pandemic has taught us, it's the way it affects people unequally and I feel like, oh, I had it easy, you know, it's, um, I'm just so, gratitude has been a big part of this whole thing for me because I just feel like there's so much that, um, that I did not have to worry about, um, that I knew that so many people had to worry about. And yet um, I did feel bereft of theater and, um, and un unmoored in a way that, was completely foreign to me and having this to hold on to and to strive for and to try to figure out. I mean, it was such, as you say, Tara, a puzzle. Um, I think of it as a, as a thing that got me through this time um, that I needed it. I needed to be working on something. And, and that just felt, I am so grateful for that, that we had something to work on. Yeah, it was also fun because we worked over the course of the year. So we did some exploration over the summer with the designers. We did a couple of readings and then we did a workshop, a week long workshop in October. And it was like it was really fascinating because it was just such an explosion of, of digital theater attempts and experiments happening. And Rinna and I were both immersed in our own worlds with that. And I think like especially Rinna being at NYU, like where I feel like universities were like such a place of like 
really like fervent activity of fervent experimentation. So she would like come back and be like, this is what my students and I are talking about. Like we came in with all these things. And then I would like go away and work on a thing and be like, this is what I figured out from working on this. So it really felt like there was just like a lot of, you know, coming together, trying things out, going away, researching, trying things on other projects. And then like, you know, doing this kind of like reconnaissance. It was, it was, it felt exciting in that way, like a real experience of, of like genuine discovery. Fantastic. And you started to bring it up. Um, so let us invite uh, two of our, our designers and our friends who have been in charge of our digital aspects of this piece, uh, Nick and Masha. Hello. <laughs> Great. And so this was like a huge, huge undertaking in terms of uh, what the set looked like and also the digital aspirations of this. So, I mean, <laughs> let's let's talk about it, friends. Let's talk about the trials and tribulations of expanding beyond Zoom theater. Do you want to start with what the workshop before I was involved when we were in San Diego? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I guess it was in the summer. summer we when we first started exploring the idea of doing things digitally, and we didn't know if we wanted to, but we were like, if we did, what aesthetics are we interested in? What you know? And so we just did a lot of research, and like Tara mentioned, we watched a lot of digital theater. We met in digital bars, which was fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I think something that we clicked in on pretty early is that we liked a certain analog handmade element or texture in the work. Like it specifically with this play going full matrix didn't feel move visually. Um, and so then once we committed to something in October, Nick came on a little bit to help figure out how we might do that and well, we learned a lot yeah i mean I, when i came on it was as much as said it was decidedly not going to be a film uh nor just a film theatrical version but something new and so we spent that whole workshop just sort of um playing with laptops working with the women trying to figure out where we can place things make it a little different than just a zoom recording but just sort of figure out the idea. Um, and it was nice because then we had a break to sort of talk over how it went and like what we wanted to do for the next iteration. And that workshop was live. So we were doing visual manipulation um, and kind of reframing oh, yeah. and taking zo the Zoom feed from all of the actors and then kind of processing it in various ways to create a world. But that was all, and that was one third give or take of the play, but that was live. And so we learned a little bit also about the limitations of in the way that we were working and kind of what number of people were working, what could be accomplished live and then what in our world felt sort of impossible. Yeah, I mean, I feel like what we came to after that workshop was, uh, for lack of a better word, control. Like we want to be able to control what they look like, what they sounded like, had the best possible quality and the best possible timing to basically set the the play, the actors, and all of us up most likely for success. So um, I got with with Michael and the club thumb people and trying to started to try and chart out what technically could allow that to happen, especially since at that time it was very much no one is allowed in these actors' homes. So it was. Um, relying on their personal computers and their equipment that they had around, lights that they had around. So we, we got together and um, came up with this kit, which is uh, a laptop, uh, a nicer camera, and a uh, microphone, as well as all the laptops came to me first so that I could then put some programs on there that I could remote and control uh, the actors' computers from anywhere, wherever we were. Because Mal and I, at that point, were still... I think we had fully settled in LA for the pandemic by then, but I could control from LA and these actors all over the country um, from one spot so we could get the best possible setup and make sure that we were recording and getting everything that we wanted. Yeah, so they could still be together live in Zoom 
to make the scene, but then we could also sneak into their computers to make sure we got what we needed and adjust all of our settings and make it as easy as possible for them because having to be your own technician is not the most fun, I would imagine. And act and, <laughs> and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that was a big challenge was like, we have these 10 amazing actors and that's such a big impetus for this play is to like bring these 10 amazing women together into a play. And, um, and so we wanted to let that to kind of center that as much as possible and that's and then the, and the process of that but of course with this in this like digital realm that gets really complicated really quickly because you're not bringing 10 people together in a room and just like filming it it's 10 remote uh cameras that you're trying to uh remote control as much as possible but at the end of the day the actors as all the actors have been doing for the past year are doing everything themselves. So all the designers are mailing themselves, mailing them stuff, you know, consulting, advising, uh, and in some cases, remote controlling their computers. Like that was a really big discovery that Nick made. Um, thank God we had that going. But at the end of the day, the actors still had to set up their computers and put position the light and do their own hair and makeup uh, with, you know, the advice of the of the designers. But um, so it was a lot to put on these actors. Um, so it was really like a challenge of how do we how do we make everybody look and feel as good as possible, you know, like to tell the story in a in a play that is, um, you know, there are there are these like big formal shifts that happen in the play, like world changing moments. There's the film noir and there's moving upstairs and downstairs. There's this house that is very like central to the story. And we need to help the audience keep track of where in the house these people are, because it's like the fact that they're all in the same house as each other is like a big layer of the, of the, the entire story. Um, so we, there were certain design things we had to achieve, but also balance that with like, how can we help it not be like just totally impossible for these for these actors to take on? Um, so that yeah, the, the these little camera kits that um, Club Thumb sent to all of the uh, actors enabled Nick to to remote control their computers, which helped a little bit alleviate some of that burden. Yeah, and yes, just to talk yes. about. Oh no, go ahead, Jay. Sorry. Oh no, no, continue. Yeah. Just to, to reiterate what we're talking about—the aesthetic of not being, you know, it's not film theater and it's not film—is the fact that there are ten cameras, and we did want to place the actors in certain places. But you know, like a typical TV show has two cameras at, at most, and so we had to deal with ten cameras and trying to reach people in their understood aesthetic of what. TV is of all of us. And so it was like, how do we bring this house that they're all in? And Andrew at Dots made this beautiful model that we then were like, oh, okay, well, let's film that too and move around. And then it was like, oh, well, let's put some figurines in there as opposed to just like putting zoom squares in the model box. It's like balancing back and forth between the, the tactile, like Masha was talking about in the film world. Yeah, and I think that yeah, I think early on, we just decided that for this version, or kind of what we were going for, that the green screen aesthetic wasn't, didn't feel texturally right. So we could have just taken the model and then green screened the model as backgrounds for rooms and so forth. But that felt a little too flat, I guess. And then we also took inspiration from the actual spaces that the actors were in. And so just to speak for Andrew, when he was designing, like the house is not entirely faithful to the actual Alva Belmont house. The interiors of the house are sort of a blend of the Ava Belmont house and then the actual reality of the actors' homes so that we could kind of, again, sort of blur the form a little bit between what's real, what's not real. Like, oh, of course, yes, there are those flowers there for real and here they're cut out and here they're in a figurine and here, et cetera. So like playing again with all of the versions of reality, but in a way that's sort of tactile. Yeah, and that all connects back to the play, like the way that the play is so fluidly moving, like it's 
it's in 1947, but then there are these like pointy moments where it feels really like contemporary. And then by the end, we're like very much in the present day. And, um, and Rinna like has like in the theater version and in this version, like they're, they're sort of different trajectories with the same idea of like different, um, there's like different formal layers going on and they start to like kind of strip away as we get into the present moment and Doris has this confrontation with Alice. Um, so the big design challenge in making the digital version of this is like in the play, they say like we're, you know, they really like point to the fact that they're in a theater and they like talk to the audience and like call it a play. And so how do we what is the version of that in the digital world where there's layers and then we like strip away? Um, how do we create that like meta meta narrative that then like reveals itself more fully in this digital version? And um, I think like that handmade quality and talking about like texture, what Masha was talking about, it really stems from the fact that like the characters are responsible or like in relationship to the design they seem to have like control over it or are like reacting to it. And so I, that, I think that's a big, a big reason why we didn't go for anything that felt like very slick and like, you know, all like digital, um, like as if it was just like a bunch of design put on top of the actors, um, that sort of tactile quality, um, like connected with that storytelling. Right. And, and I just remember that early on in the process, Masha, you said something that has always really stuck with me. So when we we're first, because all the wonderful designers, um, exclusive of Nick, who uh, came on to specifically to do film, right? But, but before that, we had a lighting designer, a costume designer, and a set designer. And so those people were already in place and talking about the show and getting ready to start designing that show. And Masha, you said something early on when we started to have these virtual discussions, which was, so now we're talking about this this conversion from thinking about theater to thinking about this virtual realm and you just it was just a little bit of a thought exercise but you said but then could we think about moving from the virtual realm back into the theater that that it's like that, that it coming full circle or something and i don't know why but that really really stuck with me and still sticks with me and maybe hey maybe we'll even get to do that uh, actually um to see what what would it be now to translate it the other way and i just thought that way of framing it was really useful yeah yeah i, I wonder about that with a lot of the virtual work that we see now some of which was made to be virtual and some of it is not but you know we love to reinterpret films on stage we reinterpret a lot of things through our different form filters and now we have a whole new bucket right on play with yeah, yeah. Um, a question from the audience was is uh and you all already started to um touch on this, but just to go in a little bit further and answer their questions. Um, were there particular opportunities that Zoom and virtual um, exploration allowed that wouldn't have been able to happen on stage or in a theater? I keep thinking about the makeout scene. <laughs> 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 Go on, go on, Masha. <laughs> <laughs> when else, I mean, I feel like Tara's masterful choreography was really good, but like when else are you going to try and untangle that knot of, you know, two women on opposite coasts in totally different houses have to comically make out in a Zoom square that we can then edit believably into a, and throw a hat. Yeah, it's, it was just, <laughs> but again, like I think now going, as we go back to the theater, again, like just even the way movement works and the way timing works, we're, we've now been in this other sp space, place, space. What I want to point to is um, the invasion. Um, and for if anybody hasn't seen the show, there's a moment when women bust into a house, right, with ironing boards, knocking down doors and all these different things happening. And, and I always wrote it like 
the in, I think it says the invasion, right? There's a couple <laughs> of beats that are that are specific, but really it's like this notion of the invasion. And I remember the first time when we did that workshop, um, which was live and insane, right? Live and insane. I really thought, oh my gosh, like that happened. The, the, uh, that story was told of these women overtaking this house. And I don't know. I mean, speaking back to M Masha's thing about like, how, how do you take that and then go into the theater with that? I, I, I can only imagine you'd use totally different tools. I don't know. But there was something about the way that the whole house could seem to be overrun was something that I thought happened so beautifully and comically and terrifyingly and psychedelically um, in this form in a way that felt um, utterly satisfying to me as a writer that I thought that was the thing that there it is um so that was kind of a, a crazy astonishing moment for me I think for me it was like it's so clear when reading it how the the house feels like a character in the play and I think in some ways that's a lot harder to do in a theater especially if you're not doing like some big budget set or whatever but um I think it was really fun to work with the model and think about scale like playing with scale and the model really helped us to go deeper into that like in in a way the play itself shifts scale or like you know the time jumping feels related to that um but yeah I I feel like there's an opportunity there and I don't know if, if to translate that back to theater whether the model would still be part of it or not it might be but um I feel like that was something that kind of unlocked from this position yeah layering is kind of easier in this medium and like layering at scale, you know, of being able to, I mean, sort of in the invasion, both visually and sonically, like the reading of the Psalm, having that be ever present, which would certainly still happen in a theater, but Magda would still be Magda sized, right? Unless we projected her potentially big over the whole set. But that in that way of, because we can completely control the audience's view in this case, you, you can layer in all of these elements just in a different way than we usually layer actors onto a set. Yeah, and close-ups too, that's a good point. Yeah. 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 Um, but still having the freedom to be abstract. Well, and Marga yeah. could be in California. We yes. could be in California. Yeah, and all the other <laughs> could be yeah. spread out all over the country. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, how did the digital um, exploration affect how the play moved forward, how it expanded, you know, um, once you started exploring in the digital realm, how did the play change and shift? Well, I, I told Tara from the beginning, and this has always been a, a guiding light for me, and it, it's a strange image, but um, Anne Washburn has her brilliant play, um, Mr. Burns, a post-apocalyptic play. And um, the last act of that play is, a play within a play um, in which of a time without electricity <laughs> and you get to witness what that play is and sort of maybe the dawning of electricity, human made electricity. And I, whenever I thought about this crazy undertaking, I thought to myself, this is a production of this play in this time. This is just like that play in Mr. Burns is, is how that play would be in that time, which might change 10 years from now and would be different. Uh, so so I tried to think of it as just this is what is happening now. We are not being in theaters right now, but that I wanted to hold to. But maybe I, I didn't I didn't want it to totally transform. I wanted to think of it as a production, not this film that we're making that is the final word on this production, that 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 there's something about it that still feels um, alive and malleable and and a reflection of this moment and nothing more. Um, and so in that sense, of course, in process, I learned so much about the play and and maybe some of the things that I learned, you know, the things that you learn in rehearsal and in production about lines that don't work and moments that aren't landing and all those sorts of things. Um, and maybe some of those will not prove to be true when we're back in the theater. Um, but by and large, I try to think of it as just a production of this play and what I am learning through this production of the play right now. 
Fantastic. If anyone want, else wants to talk yeah, about it. Yeah, I think just to throw off of what you're saying, like in theater, it's so wonderful that you can be like, oh, let's do it this way. Oh, no, let's try it this way. Oh, let's try it this way. And in this process, we could, but then we were done. <laughs> and then we had the whole editing process where it was like, oh, okay, now we're going to do that again, but slightly differently. It's not just um, seeing something over and over and over again. It's more how do we massage what we have into what we want it to eventually be, which is like a whole separate conversation that's sort of odd from a theater background to completely be in of like, you have all these collaborators, all these people in the room, and then it's just like the editor, you know, and a few other people giving notes around it. <laughs> yeah, and you learn so much from the editing, but you can't, I mean, in this version, you can't go back and reshoot, right? So like that's, whereas I feel like in theater, we do the editing as we're making the thing. It's just the timeline is different. Yeah. And I have to say, um, you know, I'm also working on um, a radio version of a different play and having that same experience. And I was saying to the director on that project, you know, I don't know if we're ever going to have to <laughs> learn learn this lesson, right, or, or incorporate this lesson, which is exactly what Nick said, which is my theater brain is used to saying, oh yeah, let's look at that, right? And then, and then a day later being like, oh, now I understand what that should be. Um, but there was, there wasn't that space. I mean, there was still the, oh, now I understand what that should be. <laughs> <laughs> um, unless you, but as you said, Nick, like massaging it, like saying, how can we bring it closer to that thing that we now understand, even though the, the raw material is, you can only do so much with it. And I thought, ooh, right. I don't know if I would have done anything differently if I knew that before, but um, but it did feel like, oh, right, my brain is not trained to work this way yet. Yeah, yeah. How was the editing process for everyone? I mean, I know how it was for me, but for everybody else. <laughs> oh yeah, let's call that out. I feel like you should talk a little bit about what you did too. You're being the interviewer here, but NJ was such a huge part of this process. NJ, what did you do during this process? Will you just share a little bit about that? Oh my gosh. I was not prepared to answer any questions. <laughs> I was prepared to only ask questions. Uh, <laughs> tell you she saved my life. She... <laughs> Uh, I think it was mostly uh, support and bringing most of what I knew from film and theater to combine the two. So really working closely with our um, assistant director who was also our stage manager and our assistant, our second assistant director and um, talking with Blake, our editor a lot about, okay, here's our editing script. <laughs> Let me know what needs to change <laughs> and um, setting things up that way. So just the combination process and being that sort of supportive help in, in the room is essentially all I did. So I mean, I it. a yeah. lot, a lot of that stuff <laughs> um, <laughs> because NJ has this background in film. Um, she was able to bring like this whole or like a very organized approach to this because we, you know, we had it's not just a film shoot. It's a, I keep I have to repeat it. It was a remote ten camera <laughs> film shoot, which is not anything like <laughs> that doesn't exist. Um, so that just meant that there were ten cameras that had, that we had to keep track of at all times, and um, for any take that we did. And if one of them something funky went, or you know, or everything seemed fine, but there was some con continuity error in this one camera, like. NJ was really keeping an eye on all of that stuff. And then also, um, as, as she just said, like keeping track of, of every take, which ones are the chosen takes and all of that. And then this editing script, which used all these like storyboard images that Andrew put together that on the fly, I was constantly changing during the shoot. So I would be like private messaging NJ, like changing everything that she was doing. <laughs> and then so that basically at the end of every shoot um, day of shooting, she would send the script over to Blake who would get started on editing. And, and so that we, we didn't have like meetings every day with Blake. 
uh, he just had the script to go off of. And then after he started to make things or um, at the beginning of each episode, we would have like one meeting where he would just make sure if he had any questions about it or whatever. Um, but that really allowed for a lot of um, many hours of editing to begin simultaneous to the shoot. Um, like, yeah, amazing. Well, you put it so- Sorry, eloquently. we turned the tables <laughs> on you, NJ. <laughs> <laughs> so eloquently put, but like, thank you. <laughs> Um, so if the audience has any other questions, thoughts, concerns, conundrums, wants a recipe from our panel, please let us know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get those over to you. Um, but generally, um, you all would love, to, I would love to hear more and more about, um, just your collaboration process and how your past experiences really influenced what we did in rehearsals as well as on, on the day shooting, you know. You know, this, this process weirdly like made me think about this, another process I had with doing um, motion capture for an animated virtual reality project, which I know that these things can sound more further apart than each other, but it's like, it, they both involve like invented technologies or invented use of technologies that like, it's like you put in as much research and thought and expertise into it. But at the end of the day, you're doing, you're using this thing in a way that it wasn't originally intended to be used for. So there's an, an inherent experiment to that. Um, and so and I remember like going over with Nick, like, does this seem like it will take this amount of time? What do you think? He's like, I think so maybe like, but there's really no way to know because none of us have ever done this before. Um, and like it's, and it's not a thing that, that has been done in this way before because it's just really specific to the needs of this project. Um, and so, you know, you can go in with all of your plans and then, you know, something completely unexpected will go wrong with the technology. And so when they were talking about the editing process, well, this is all we could get. It sometimes it was because of some like internet issue that somebody was having on their end or like, you know, the internet's out on my block. Oh, then what do you do? So just like constant um, kind of rolling with it. And, and then when you get a take, that's like, like on a day where there's a lot of technical glitches and you get a full take without glitches, you're just like, oh my gosh, this precious, this precious thing that we got a full take, you know, um, it's, it's just a complete, it's a complete like sh shift in, in the way we, um, we think about, uh, perfection or mm -hmm. and in that sense like the, that scrap the scrappiness is also a product of the inherent ex experimentation of the process um that i think so many people all over the world have been doing this past year in the arts um and i and i i think that i mean luckily we had a team that were all really good at rolling with it and had a good sense of humor about it so that all just made for you know more laughter and whatever really good joke um so so uh, there was also kind of a warmth in, in that um in mm. that process too that i i feel like i hope comes through in the in the work itself and just to give a, another club thumb shout out um it, it's i feel like it's a part of the story to say um when maria first asked me to write this play or write a play and I told her this idea and 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 you know she's a, a great theater mind and we were talking about this idea in lots of different ways and I had this very specific idea um about these women um and and I also want to say Ryan Gedrick who um now is I think full time at Club Thumb, but at that time was was working with Club Thumb, and um, he became a, a research assistant for me when I was just saying like, oh, I know about this night. I have these four pages of material, but but I need more. I need more, and he just 
was hugely helpful to me in, in organizing that material. But at a certain point, I wrote a draft and I had this idea in that draft. And Masha and Nick, I'm not even sure if you guys know this, but um, that there would be double casting, that the women on Team Doris would be double cast as the women on Team Alice and that you would see them sort of switch, switch sides. It was this idea sort of about how similar they are and all this stuff. And Maria and Club Thumb and everybody at Club Thumb, we had this reading and the play was completely illegible. Do you know what I mean? Like you just had no idea what was happening ever because like, who are you and what's your, what's going on? And I just remember in that moment, Maria um, graciously said, I think you need all those people. And, and that's a producer who's saying, I know that you're coming to me with this six person play and, and now you're turning into an eight per, a 10 person play. Um, that's what needs to happen if we're following this story. And that is a rare and wonderful thing for someone to be looking at the material and saying, no, in order to tell this story, we need more bodies. And I feel like that generosity and and sight of saying we need a lot of people to help us do this carried on through this technological process very very much right so that when people said i need an assistant and i need an assistant and i need an assistant and my assistant needs an assistant and someone needs to be doing this and do you have someone who can also be there to like run computers to New Jersey or um, that Club Thumb was really, really present for that. And that's a huge part of the collaboration that I that I don't recall any instances when someone was saying, well, I could do this if I had a little bit more resources to help me out in which they were told, no, there's no resources available. And so that is a huge part of this collaboration, too. Yeah, totally. I mean, even just at the very in the very beginning of last summer, when we didn't even know if this idea could work or not, like, just to be like, okay, here's just some money for you, you guys, like the design team and Rena and Tara to just like meet and just have so whatever, like this, this money will just cover that time. And when you run out of money for that time, just let us know. And then we can kind of reevaluate how you're feeling about it like and we came back and said okay yeah we want to do this next step and and so um just like that that in investment in such an such like a an early part of this process and and to just keep yeah exactly what Renee just said like it just keep it kept that continued throughout of like yes yes so what do you need yes what do you need um and of course and a project as I keep repeating that is not that does, has no blueprint for it is is very risky um, in a lot of ways um, and that definitely I think reverberated for the whole through the whole team I mean it made us all feel like okay we can do this that's fantastic so we only have like a few more minutes left um, with all of you before we before we disappear and go to eat dinners and, you know, maybe get into the world again. Uh, <laughs> but what from uh, this experience can you take into theater now or, or are you thinking of expanding any of the work that you do so that it can reach more international audiences um, in, a, in a new way, bringing in more audiences? I know this is a, like, a five point question, but <laughs> do your best. Um, well, I just want to grab onto something that Masha said about that makeout session. <laughs> The, the the most the, the the longest distance makeout session ever happening. Um, because I, I think what you were pointing to also was that um, nothing could be taken for granted. Do you know what I mean? That there was no saying, just do it, right? There was no just do, like, what would that even begin to mean? So you had to in, reinvestigate all your assumptions about, okay, what does it mean for two people to kiss, right? And something about that energy and that thought process feels to me like something I want to take into my work. Um, and all these different things about the ways of, um, solving problems when, as Tara said, there was no blueprint, right? So so you're really starting from no fixed assumptions about how anything could possibly be. Um, 
is terrifying and difficult and challenging in all those ways, but also just makes me think, wow, when's the last time that I walked into a process knowing absolutely nothing about anything about how an actor would read her script. Do you know what I mean? That even that was something that we were going to have to figure out together as a team. And, and to me, something about that energy, I know it's important that, that something about being stripped of all everything that you think you know and having to be in present to what's actually happening and see how you can solve those problems feels like that's the thing I want to take forward emotionally and intellectually. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where my mind went as well. I think marrying that idea and Tara, what you were saying about kind of club thumbs MO during this whole thing of just, I think on us as artists and creators and on institutions as well, this idea of just admitting that we don't know. And that, I mean, Rena, I, like, I, I agree that we usually know how an actor is going to read their script, maybe, but we do, we take so much as a given and we come into every project with so many preconceived notions, um, again, on all of sides of that process. And it would just be better if we didn't, which is more difficult. It's more difficult budget wise, it's more difficult schedule wise, but I think the potential payoff is so huge and the way our collaborations can be like it's just so much more full of potential. Um, and so that idea of just finding comfort, like, or a way to be comfortable with being uncomfortable or whatnot, just in the unknown and kind of asking more questions rather than being like, okay, well, the audience is gonna walk in through this door. Why? Mm. Yeah, are those preconceived notions or like default notions just are like shortcuts. Like that's, and I think, just like the way most of us end up being in theater is like this like hamster wheel of like doing too many things and whatever. And so those short, we just lean on those shortcuts. And I, I feel that this time has, it's made it impossible to use shortcuts. There are no shortcuts. Um, but I also feel like for a lot of, people, I, I hope this lasts. I feel like it was, um, I felt this more strongly last year and I'm already seeing it maybe melt away in some cases, but like with the pandemic and the shutdown, I felt like a lot of theaters really started to put like care at the center of their work or, or that idea of being a little bit more care centered <laughs> became uh, something that people started talking about more. Um, and I do think that partly the interruption of your previously scheduled program kind of forced everyone to do that. Um, and that's something that, uh, I mean, I think like Club Thumb has always been a, a care-centered um, theater in my experience, um, but even, even to see like their usual system of how they do it, their usual season, to be completely upended and, and to be like, well, I guess we're doing this thing, you know, like, um, and to see the adjustments that they made. And then similarly for every artist involved in this project and seeing all those adjustments being made. Um, I feel like some of it came out of necessity, but also because it was be due to a pandemic, like this widespread illness and like death, um, I, I think it also just like forced uh, a, an, a, a kind of mental shift um, and to think how we think about the way we work with each other and what we're asking each other to do and how we're compensating that time and all of that. Um, and I, I do really hope that um, that you know, care centered thinking continues. That feels like a really good, uh, <laughs> a, a good moment to, to pop in and say, you know, thank you all for your very gracious words uh, about Club Thumb, of course. Um, but also just thank you. Um, thank you for this really enlightening, really interesting, really rich conversation. Um, and thank you for your beautiful work. Um, I hope those of you who are watching, if any of you haven't seen it, 
um, that you that you do watch it. You can watch it as many times as you like. You can, you know, it's for us. This was a you know as a as a company that usually produces plays that have like eleven performances in a eighty nine seat theater. Um, uh, the the fact that people can watch this all over the world, um, sort of like a for us a radical access project that's beyond you know our scope otherwise is is really exciting. Um, we're going to run it for for a while, and so spread the word, uh, check it out. Um, but mostly, just uh, thank you, thank all of you for for taking the time to be together um, right now, and thanks. Uh, and Jay and Tara and Rena and Nick and Masha for, for giving us um, your time now. Delightful to see you all. Look forward to doing it in person soon. <laughs> and so long. <laughs> <laughs>